we're going to talk about the plans and ideas that come out of the Queen's Gambit declined, specifically the Tartakower variation. Now, if you've never heard of that before, that's okay. I'm going to explain what that is. The reason I had to pick a specific variation is because if I tried to give you the plans and ideas for all of the Queen's Gambit decline and every single line that comes out of that, this video would be like 10 hours long, not exaggerating. So I had to pick something. We'll talk about all of those particular lines for that variation, and then we'll come back next time, do a different variation, and we'll just kind of chip away at it. This will be the start of a series, okay? So Queen's Gambit Decline. Let's just back up, make sure we're all on the same page here. When you play D4, D5 is one of the most common responses. C4 is the Queen's Gambit, and Black primarily has three main responses. They can accept the Gambit, Queen's Gambit Accepted, they can decline the gambit, queen's gambit declined, right? They declined to take the pawn, it makes sense. Or they can play what's called the sloth, c6, okay? In this video, we're talking specifically about the queen's gambit declined, okay? And the main line that we're gonna kind of focus on here is knight to c3, putting more pressure on d5, knight to f6, black defends, bishop to g5, pinning the knight, and bishop to e7, black says, nope, I don't wanna deal with the pin, let me break the pin with bishop to e7. E3, now E3 and knight to F3, a lot of times these moves are interchangeable. You play one and then you play the other. You could also play knight F3 and then E3. It's probably gonna transpose. Black castles, we play knight to F3, and then black attacks our bishop. We don't wanna give up the bishop pair so easily, so we go back to H4. And in this position, if black decides to go for the plan of B6, this is called the Tartakower variation. The idea is since we're not allowing this bishop to get out, right, which is one of the drawbacks of the queen's gambit decline, you block your bishop in, black says, okay, I'm going to fiend Kedowit over here, and at least it can help out in the game somehow, you know, by supporting the e4 square, maybe I can play knight to e4 or something like that, okay? That's the idea. This is the starting position for the plans and ideas that we are going to talk about. Now, I'm going to focus on giving you the plans from the white side, but just know that if you play this as black, Knowing what white's plans are is really helpful to you, right? You, you kind of know like okay, what to expect from white, and you can use that to plan what you're going to play, okay? So it's going to be beneficial regardless of if you play this from white or from black. So from this position, there's essentially three major, major plans that white can ad adopt. Number one is kind of the just ignore it, don't really worry too much about what black is doing, and develop your pieces naturally. Okay, so for example, just bringing out my bishop, allowing black to, you know, kind of continue their development, castling, knight b to d7, queen to e2, c5, and bringing the rook over. Notice white didn't do anything fancy, just finished developing, castled, and we left the tension. We didn't take, we didn't, you know, do, do anything with that. We just totally left the tension, okay? That's kind of... Plan number one. Okay, so after black plays rook to c8, um, there's kind of three ideas that I want you to keep in mind from this position. And the way that I'm going to start off this conversation is by showing you a game. This is a game played between a 2,500 rated player as white and a 2,200 rated player as black. Okay, so I'm actually going to jump back to the beginning so you can see how this game started. Now, it's interesting. It doesn't start the exact same way that I showed you but it transposes to the exact same position. And this is actually a really critical concept to understand. With the Queen's Gambit declined, a lot of times the moves are played out of order. Not everybody plays the exact same moves in the exact same order, but a lot of times you get the same position. So let me show you what I mean. This person played knight to f6. Notice, sorry, knight to f6. Notice they didn't play d5, okay? But then we get c4, knight f3, d5. Now it's starting to look like a Queen's Gambit declined. The knight comes out. Bishop to e7, bishop to g5. Look at this. We transposed to the exact same position that I showed you, but it was in a different way. And that's going to happen. So it's very important that you not just memorize the exact moves, but look at the position and understand where are the pieces placed. A knight on c3, a knight on f3, a bishop on g5, a pawn on e3. Castled, bishop on e7, knight on f6, right? So that if your opponent kind of does one move instead of the other, but you end up transposing, you, you need to be aware of that. That's what I'm trying to say. H6 goes back. B6, the start of the Tartakower variation. Okay, this is what I showed you. And white goes for the plan of, I'm just going to ignore it and develop my pieces. Now, there's two other ways that you can approach this position 
instead of instead of this just sort of develop and castle and not worry about it, we're going to come back to those. But um, I want to focus on this one first, and then I also have three sub points inside of this one. So it's I know it's kind of a lot of threes. You got three three main plans, and then three sub points inside of the first plan. Anyway, hopefully it, it makes sense when we get into it. So he castles knight bd7, queen e2. This is kind of the, the setup, right? This is a very solid setup. If you're wondering where you should put your pieces, queen goes on e2. The rook comes over to d1. Usually black is going to strike with c5. This is kind of how black creates threats in the center with these two pawns, okay? Rook to c8, and watch carefully what the 2500 rated player plays, because I thought this was a very good move to remember. Bishop to g3, okay? Now, here's an interesting thing. Initially, when we go here, it's like pinning the knight, which kind of puts some pressure on the center, which is a good thing, develops the piece. But as soon as black plays bishop e7, we're not really threatening anything anymore here. Like, black can move this knight whenever they want, and all that's going to be is just trade. So we don't really need our bishop sitting there. If anything, when the knight moves, it's actually, you know, our bishop could actually be a target. We have to worry about it getting captured. So by bishop, going bishop to g3... We kind of solved that problem, but also what's interesting about this to me is it takes away the c7 square. And if you ask yourself the question, where is black going to develop their queen to? I don't actually know. There's there's nowhere to go to, right? Unless you want to go to e8, but that doesn't make sense. You're trapping your own rook if you do that. The queen is kind of stuck. Black's pieces are actually a little bit cramped up, right? If you imagine, if you leave your bishop there, maybe you did something like this. Let's just say black brings the knight in and you trade. Notice how it frees up black's position. Now this rook is ready to swing over. The queen is in a nice little square there. And so I really do like this idea of bishop to g3. So this is one point that I want you to remember, okay? Bishop to g3, just dropping it back and taking control of that diagonal. Now in this game, black played knight to e4, and we had this trade. And this is actually something that happens quite often, where this pawn will trade for this pawn. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later in the video, but once this trade happens, this brings me to the second point that I want you to remember. And um, yeah, this person didn't do it. They played rook a to c1, which wasn't maybe the greatest move, but the move bishop to f5. This is an interesting move to keep in mind because once that pawn gets traded off, this diagonal, becomes available to your bishop. And it's kind of an annoying move because you're pinning the knight. If this knight ever tries to move, you're going to take the rook, right? And the only real way that black can, can make you move that bishop is by playing g6. But for those of you who have been following my channel for any amount of time, what's the problem with this move? Well, yeah, it weakens the king. And now you have some long-term weaknesses here because black is expanding. You can actually even go back to h3, keep that annoying pin, and again, almost baiting black to pushing f5. Now, they can do this. This is an aggressive way for black to play. But now they have to be very careful about their king. Their king is much weaker now. These are weak squares. You can actually play knight to e5. You're attacking this one. And if they take you, you're going to take back. And you have this really annoying bishop in the center. And it's, it's an interesting position. But I personally like the fact that we've made black weaken their king side. Okay? So keep that in mind as well. You've got bishop to g3 is one idea. And the other idea is bishop to f5. Um, and it's very annoying. Notice how both of these bishops are really just laser beaming down, you know, black's position, kind of causing some problems, okay? The other idea, which was not played in this game, the 2500 actually kind of went wrong here, brought the rook over, and they still won the game. This is kind of like a human-looking move. You just bring your rook over to potentially, you know, counter black's rook here on the c-file. But what Stockfish recommends, and I like this idea, is the move a4. And what you're doing is basically saying, hey, if, if you let me, let's just say rookie eight, I'm going to push it again. And if you let me, let's just say knight to f6, I'm going to trade it, and I'm going to bring my rook down. And look at this. This is very annoying for black. The rook's on the seventh rank, starting to create some serious threats. And I don't know. It's not that easy to defend. Remember, this bishop is still over here causing problems, right? So you can see how that's really a, a powerful threat. And as soon as we play here, if black decides to take it, yes, they temporarily win a pawn, but look at these guys. Double isolated, very weak. And at some point, the queen's probably going to want to move somewhere. And as soon as it does, guess what? We're going to take that pawn. Then we're going to probably take this pawn. 
And it's it's a very nice position. Actually, bishop f5 is a good way to follow up. And you can see, again, lots of threats that black has to watch out for. Okay, so I think this is some of the some of the better plans that you can play in the Tartakower variation. Now, let's go back. Let's just re recap, okay? When, let's see, when we get right here, when we see the move b6, the plan that I just talked about was bishop to d3 and finish development, right? You play bishop d3, you castle, you play queen e2, you bring your rook over to the d file. And then we can go into those other lines, okay? However, there are two other ways that you can play the game from right here instead of bishop to d3. Now, the second way that you can approach this position as white instead of just bishop d3 and developing is you can actually trade here. And usually what happens is the knight will take because black actually wants to relieve some tension here and get some breathing room. So they like this trade. You take, they take, you put your rook on the c file, open c file, your half open c file, and black actually plays the move bishop to e6. Now, it turns out this is apparently better than going to b7. And it kind of makes sense. Like on b7, you're not really doing much. You're just basically hitting your own pawn. Whereas on e6, you still get some control over here. Remember some of the, the lines that I showed you where the bishop was kind of annoying on f5? You know, you don't have to worry about that. And it just turns out that this is just a better square for the bishop, okay? And at this point, um, I'm gonna show you a game that was played by Bobby Fischer against Boris Spassky in the World Championship. Uh, back in 1972. Okay, so we're actually going to go back to the very beginning. And again, I want to point out how this position came from a different move order. Okay, super, super common that the game starts out in a different way and ends up in a queen's gambit declined, right? So watch this. E6, knight f3, d5, d4. See that? We transpose from an English into a queen's gambit declined. Okay, and you're going to see here comes the knight. Here comes the bishop. Now it's starting to look familiar, right? Like the line that I showed you. Okay, castles, e3. Here we go. h6, b6. Exact position, Tartakower variation, but we arrived in a different way, okay? So we take, uh, black takes. This is just what I showed you guys. We get the trade. Rook comes over and the bishop goes to e6. Now, what does Bobby Fischer, arguably the best chess player of all time, what does he do in this position? Queen to a4. And the, the idea behind queen a4 is actually pretty interesting. Um, usually, what black is going to do here is play c5. Okay, so watch what Fisher does after c5 happens. Queen to a3. And you can see one of the main ideas of going to a4. He actually wanted to come back to a3 and line up on this diagonal. Very interesting, right? But it's a, it's a nice threat. And notice the pawn is pinned. You can't take this if you're black or you lose your queen for free. So, and also you can't move, also lose your queen. And white is simply threatening to take it, right? Like if you do a move like this, you're just going to take it and win a pawn, okay? So black doesn't really have too many options. Uh, rook c8 was played here. I guess you could also play knight to d7, just something to defend. But Spassky decided to play rook to c8, and Fisher played bishop to b5. Another kind of a weird looking move, because it's like, aren't you going to get chased away by the pawn? And that's exactly what Spassky plays, but notice what Fisher does. He doesn't even worry about it. Why? This is pinned. You can't you can't do that. You lose your rook. So he just trades and he castles. And this is pretty common in a lot of Queen's Gambit openings where one player, sometimes it's white, sometimes it's black, but one player ends up with two pawns on the D and C files just like this. And the other player has, you know, the pawns like this. Okay, this is what I'm trying to trying to say. And it's interesting because those pawns they can be great because it's like, look at black controlling the center, you know, all these squares. They can also become weaknesses because, you know, Fisher can just line up. And if you're not careful, you might lose your pawns. So it's a double-edged sword and you have to kind of be careful. But this is something that you will see quite often in the Queen's Gambit. All right, so uh, he plays rook a7, which actually does renew the threat of taking the bishop. And now Fisher retreats. The game goes on. It gets a little bit crazy. He's making use of, you know, the pin here right? There's all kinds of pins actually happening on this pawn, which is funny. Um, interesting game. We're not going to look at the whole thing because this is primarily focused on, a, you know, the opening, but that's definitely an idea that you need to keep in mind. Okay, so let's just kind of recap that. As soon as you see b6, Tartakower variation, the other option instead of developing is to trade, 
simplify some of this and then go for a queen move. Sorry, after the rook, you go for a queen move with the idea that when you see c5, you drop back to a3. Now, here's something interesting. I'm going to show you another game that was played more recently by Hikaru Nakamura. Let me pull up this one real fast. All right, so here's the game Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So. Hikaru is white. And this one actually, they played basically the, the main line. There wasn't too much crazy transposition happening. But here we go b6, enter into the Tartar Cower. Hikaru takes, takes, takes. We've seen this before. And he plays queen b3. So almost the same move, but a little bit different. But watch what happens. He transposes into the exact same position that we saw in Fisher's game, right? So similar idea, except he, instead of going to a4, he goes to b3, okay? But again, he puts the queen on the diagonal and Wesley so also plays rook c8, bishop b5. So, you know, probably Hikaru was, was following Fisher's game um, is, is what I imagine. King to f8, so this is a different move, if you remember, than what we saw in the other game. And then Hikaru trades. And he plays king to d2, which is interesting. Um, I guess something about this endgame that he, he didn't like as much. I'm not exactly sure why. This is interesting to me, giving up the, you know, the double isolated pawns. Personally, I don't think I, I like that decision, but I'm not sure what the, the logic was. Anyway, same idea here. And basically, we're into an endgame now, so I'm not going to keep analyzing it all the way through the end of the game. But you saw the exact same idea, except he implemented it with queen b3 instead of queen a4. That's really the, the point that I wanted to make. You can mix it up and still kind of go for the same plan. Okay, so let me just do a little bit of recap here. Going back to this position, when you see b6, we looked at bishop d3, castles, queen e2, rook d1, just developing and kind of ignoring the tension, right? We also looked at capturing and simplifying it out and then bringing the queen over to a5 and a3. And then the third option that you have is kind of a hybrid. Okay, let me explain this. Do you remember what I said when I said after all of this trading, the bishop was actually better on e6 than on b7? So we are trying, it, this third option here for white is trying to take advantage of the fact that we would be better off if the bishop was over here instead of on e6. And the way that we can accomplish that is to essentially do something like this. Just sort of waste a move and wait until black moves the bishop, and then we want to go and simplify the position. And the way that's, you could say, easiest to do that is by capturing here first, capturing here, and now we end up with this position where this bishop is a little bit awkward. It's just hitting the pawn, but you don't even have your knight to hop into e4, you know, to, to benefit from that, and it's kind of a misplaced piece. At least that's what we're betting. Okay. That's kind of the point behind this other plan. So just to recap that, essentially we, we waste one move before we capture. It doesn't have to be bishop b3. It could also be like rook c1. Um, but you kind of just waste, or even bishop e2, maybe you just kind of waste a move. And as soon as you see the bishop go to b7, that's when you say, okay, now I'm ready to kind of simplify some stuff here and let's, let's trade this off. Okay. Another way to think of it is if you trade right away, you're potentially opening up this bishop along this diagonal. If you wait until it goes to b7, you don't have to worry about that anymore. It's already been moved. Okay, that's another way to kind of think of it. So this is sort of the third plan that you have as a white in, in this Tartikauer variation. Now, let's look at a game. I have another one that I want to show you. All right, so here's the last game we're going to look at. This is between two 2600 rated players. And notice the opening again. Again, we see this where it doesn't start out as a queen's gambit. It starts out with knight f3, knight f6. You have no idea where this game is going to go. And then watch this. c4, e6, knight c3, d5, d4. Look at that. Here we are. Queen's gambit declined. Okay? Super common, especially at the top levels. You see this transposition stuff happening all the time. Bishop g5, h6. Bishop goes back. Castles, e3. We've seen this position. And now, b6. Okay, so after all that... We end up in a Tartikauer variation. So what does this person do? They play bishop d3, which kind of looks like you're just going into that plan of, I'm just going to develop, right? I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to play bishop d3. I'm going to castle. I'm going to play queen e2. But as soon as they see bishop b7, they say, okay, now I'm going to simplify the position. And if you remember what I said, trade off the knight first, then they take on d5, and here we go. We've simplified that tension but we've got Black's bishop over on b7 where we want it, where it's not quite as effective. Now, 
castles. C5, again, black is sticking with the, the standard idea of this is how black strikes back at the center to get counterplay with C5, okay? And white takes. So again, we see the same setup where black has those two pawns on D5 and, and uh, C5, but white has the two half open files. And like I mentioned, this looks really nice for black, and it is. They have a lot of central control. But but also those pawns can be targets, and they have to you know have to be really careful. And so you get these really interesting uh, dynamics with these types of positions. So queen to b three is one of the main ideas here. You bring the queen out to basically harass that bishop. Yes, there is a fork, but if we're white, we don't care about that because when we take here, we're also threatening rook. So black doesn't even have time to take this where they lose their rook, right? So we're not really worried about that. So bishop to c six. And now we are worried about it because now it is a legit threat. And so this person dropped the bishop back. From what I've seen, you can also go for b5, bishop to b5, and try to trade and go into an endgame. Both of these moves seem to be playable, kind of a matter of preference of if you are more comfortable with endgames and you want to trade, you can go for that. If not, you want to keep more pieces on the board, you would go back to e2, okay? And then the primary idea is that, you know, if you're white, you want to probably bring these rooks over, line up on the pawns, and see if you can tactically win a pawn. But it gets very tricky. And let's just look at this game a little bit more. For example, the knight comes in. The rook comes over. He could have taken this pawn, but watch what happens. This is kind of an example of what I'm talking about when it gets pretty tricky. It looks like, oh, I can just win a pawn. Takes, takes, takes. It's a free pawn. Not so fast. And there's a couple of reasons. Number one is there's this. Although then you actually have rook a to d1, which is pretty nice for white, because if the knight moves, you take this pawn. But there's this move, rook to b8, and now you have to throw in this check, and there's this line here where this happens, you have to move to c3. This happens, it's defended by the queen, so you trade, I guess the knight takes, and you get this position. It's a pretty equal endgame. You gotta move your bishop because it's under attack. I personally, I, I like black's position because the rook's already on the second rank, but according to the engine, it, it's pretty equal. But that just kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Like, it's very tricky. And even though it looks like, oh, there's a free pawn, not necessarily, right? So, um, yeah, there's there's definitely a lot to be to be said about this position. But just to kind of summarize and recap the main plans here, when the Tardic Hour variation happens, if you're playing as white, you've got three options. Number one, you basically just ignore the tension and develop your pieces. You go bishop d3, you play castles, you play queen e2, and you play rook to d1. Okay, we have we saw that. We saw the ideas of bishop g3, bishop f5 later on, and maybe a4, a5. And then there's also the idea of simplifying right away. So you would get something like this, takes, 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 takes. You just trade a bunch of stuff, right? And then you would go for queen to a4. Uh, sorry, rook to c1 first, um, and then queen to a4, right? This is what Fisher played, and then you, you go back to a3, okay? And then the third option is sort of like a hybrid where you just do a move to wait, like a waiting move, and as soon as you see bishop to b7, that's when you simplify by starting with here, and then you get into this position, okay? So those are the main options. And one final thing I'll mention here, when you play bishop d3, if your opponent takes here, um, which some people will do, you can simply take back. When they go bishop b7, you can just castle, and they're probably going to play c5 at some point. And a lot of times what happens here is, let's just say queen e2, they take, and you can take. You get a very equal and even position. Notice how the pawn structure is almost the exact same. Black has these four pawns, we have these four pawns. Black has two, we have two. It's It's identical, essentially. And so the rooks are going to come over. Black's probably going to do the same thing. I would say I, I prefer white just a little bit only because our queen is already on a nice square and black still has to kind of figure out how to do that. And if they're not careful, once we bring our rooks over right away, the queen can, can get into some trouble. Okay. So for example, let's just say they bring the knight here. We bring, let's just say this rook over. I don't know exactly where black's queen is going to go. Like if it goes here, it's going to start getting chased around. And, and it's got to be really careful where it goes. There's actually some tactics that are starting to pop up, but just, I'll just show you one. Like, let's just say it goes to b8. There's this move, knight takes e6. And the point is that after takes, we've got a fork, okay? And the queen is no longer defending the knight. We have two attackers, only one defender, and we simply take and look at this. We're actually already winning. So 
it is very tricky for black to figure out where the queen's going to go in this line. And so I think if you're playing as white, this should be pretty pleasant. But I just wanted to kind of mention some people, you know, will try to take that pawn. Uh, but that shouldn't give you too much trouble. All right, guys. So we looked at the Tartakower variation. There are a lot of other variations, okay, besides this in just the Queen's Gambit decline, which we will go over. If you're wondering where I'm learning all this stuff from, because I'm not an expert in this. This book right here, Fundamental Chess Openings, if you can see that. This is one of my favorite opening books. It's just enough information that you're well prepared for the opening, but it's not overwhelming and you don't have to spend like 10 hours studying. It's really a nice balance. It covers every major opening. So whatever you play, it's going to be in here unless you're playing some really funky stuff that nobody's ever heard of. But all, all the main lines and even some of the unorthodox ones are in here. It gives you just enough, you know, to, to learn the main lines, the ideas, and so I highly recommend it. I'll put a link below if, if you're interested. But yeah, that's one of my favorite opening books. And that's what we're going to be going through. Um, okay. I think it's going to be a longer video. I don't know. I haven't edited it yet. But it seems like it's a little bit longer than my usual ones. Let me know if this is helpful to you guys and how I can make it better. I really do uh, listen to your feedback and appreciate that. So all right, guys. I'll see you next time. And as always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.